Hey, future respiratory therapist. We got a topic for you today that I get lots of questions about. I can't even give one person's name here because I get so many questions on what is flow. And we talk about flow all the time in respiratory therapy. So you have got to understand the concept of flow. And when we say flow, what we're talking about is the speed the, 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 the speed of movement of gas or fluid. Now, in respiratory therapy, we're primarily talking about gas. So, flow is simply how fast is gas being moved from a device to your patient. Or, if you're talking about your patient's inspiratory flow, it's talking about how much flow are they bringing in upon inspiration. We can also talk about peak expiratory flow in the monitoring of asthma. This is how fast can the patient move out the, the volume of gas in their lungs, how fast can they exhale it? And it'll give you in liters per minute the speed of that gas. So, so this it's so important to understand flow. You have to get it. So today we're gonna just take a few minutes here and I'm gonna break down flow in, ver in, in various respiratory therapy procedures. So hopefully you have a better understanding of what flow is. Now remember, flow is in regards to the speed of gas. So let's talk about a nasal cannula. If you have a nasal cannula on two liters per minute versus six liters per minute, you need to understand that six liters per minute is delivering the nasal cannula is delivering oxygen, because hopefully you have it set up to oxygen, hopefully you're not giving room air through a nasal cannula. So you have your nasal cannula hooked up to an oxygen flow meter. The six liters per minute is delivering more oxygen to your patient because it's delivering a higher flow of oxygen to your patient. Six liters per minute greater than two liters per minute. Now, if we estimate how much of an FiO2 we're delivering, we know this is variable. But we know that two liters per minute is approximately 28%. And we know that six liter per minute is approximately six times four is 24 plus 20 is 44%. Okay, approximately. So it makes sense. If you're delivering oxygen through a nasal cannula at six liters per minute, that's more oxygen coming out quicker, it delivers a higher FiO2 to your patient. That makes sense, right? Very, very, that's very, very basic. But this is where flow becomes, this, this is the first time you probably heard about flow, was in regards to either a, a gas cylinder or a flow meter attached to a device such as a nasal cannula. Now, we also talk about flow when we talk about our our air entrainment devices, or also known as our Venturi devices. Okay, Venturi device and air entrainment device are not the same thing, but they function under the same principle, which is the Bernoulli, Bernoulli's principle. This is where you have gas being delivered from the flow meter through a device, but there's a air entrainment device that is also drawing in outside room air. When you draw in that outside room air, you increase the total flow from the device. So let's just say you have a trait collar hooked up to a large volume nebulizer, which is an air entrainment device. And this trait collar is set at 40%. Okay? Now, you got to understand that this trait collar set at 40% and a flow, let's say a flow of 10 liters per minute. Okay? So if I was to ask you, what's your total flow on your air entrainment device, trait collar at 40% and 10 liters, you might would be instinctive to say 10 liters per minute is my flow. But that's your set flow. Now remember, I just told you that air entrainment devices using the Bernoulli, Bernoulli's principle or the Bernoulli effect draws in room air into the device. Therefore, it delivers a higher flow. So you have to go to your air to oxygen ratio. So we know that 40%, our air to oxygen ratio is three to one. Now what this says is that for every one part oxygen, 
you're entraining three parts room air. This is how the 100% coming from the flow meter, this right here is 100% coming from the flow meter, but because you're entraining three parts of 21%, then it equates to 40%. Okay? So, if you've got one part oxygen and three parts air, then your total parts are four. And if you multiply that times 10, which is what we're set on, you'll see here that our total flow actually being delivered to our patient is 40 liters per minute. And this concept is what makes a trait collar a high flow device, assuming that 40 liters per minute exceeds your patient's inspiratory flow. Now we can guesstimate that that your patient's inspiratory demand flow, how fast they're breathing in, is approximately three times their minute ventilation. So let's just say their minute ventilation is 10 liters per minute. So minute ventilation, VE, equals 10 liters per minute. We multiply that times three, your patient's inspiratory demand flow is approximately 30 liters per minute. Now because the device we're using is delivering 40, and 40 is greater than 30, then this patient is going to be receiving 40% oxygen, a fixed FiO2, and a flow that exceeds your patient's inspiratory flow, and that's the definition of a high flow oxygen device. You can do this same concept with a Venturi mask. Same concept, just instead of saying trait collar, say Venturi mask. And it's the same thing, okay? So that's flow in regards to high flow oxygen devices, specifically our air entrainment and our venturi devices. Now, what if we take it up a step and we talk about some of our positive airway devices? Let's talk about Metaneb. Okay? When we're giving a Metaneb, our goal is to raise the patient's um, baseline pressure. We want to increase pressure. This is where you see the CPEP, continuous positive expiratory pressure on the metaneb. And, and when you're doing this, the patient is either doing a mouthpiece or you're doing a mask. They're breathing against this flow coming from the metaneb. Now, what if I want to get a higher pressure? What if you have a patient doing the metaneb correctly? They have a good seal, but you're only getting a, a uh, airway pressure of, of seven on your manometer. And you say, well, I'd rather be closer to 15. How could you do that? Well, one trick you can do, and it's really not a trick, it's the way it works, is increase the flow. So if you increase flow, you will increase pressure. When you're talking about positive airway devices, understand that if you increase flow, you will increase pressure. Okay? So, I want to put that out there also. So, we've talked about a nasal cannula. We've talked about air entrainment devices. We've talked about positive airway devices such as Metaneb. You can do the same thing with an easy pap. If you increase the flow on an easy pap, you'll also subsequently increase the baseline pressure. Um, not so much on the AccuPAP because the AccuPAP functions off of a spring dial that establishes the expiratory positive airway pressure. So, so, so really easy PAP and Metaneb, remember increasing flow increases pressure. Increases flow a little bit, watch your pressure manometer go up to 12, 15, and you go, okay, this is a more effective therapy now. Okay? Now, staying with positive pressure, we're going to move into mechanical ventilation. And when you talk about flow and mechanical ventilation, there's a lot of different things we can talk about. Okay, so uh, the first one is kind of the same concept I've just given you. If you have a patient, let's just say on AC with a rate of 12, tidal volume of 500, PEEP of 5, and 40%. And this is VC, AC. And they're on a flow of 40. <clears throat> So flow equals 40, okay? And your peak inspiratory pressures are coming in at 22. Now you go in there and you say, you know what, I, this flow 
Um, I don't like this flow set on 40, which just go with me right here. There's no other data to tell you why 40 wouldn't be sufficient, but just go with me, okay, for the, making this point. If you increased the flow to 60 liters per minute, just like with Metadev, you are now giving the breath faster. So you're giving that set tidal volume of 500 at a faster rate. If you give it faster, then your pips will increase. Okay, now let's, let's change this up just a little bit. What would you do in this situation? If you had, and this is all the data you have, 42 and you come in, your pips are 42 and you come in and you find your flow set on 80 liters per minute. Now here, if 500 is an appropriate size tidal volume for your patient, and you go, man, I don't, we don't want to go down on a tidal volume anymore because we don't want to affect minute ventilation. What could I do to get my pips down? Well, it's quite simple right here. Take your flow and turn it down to 50 liters per minute and your pips will go down. Okay? Now, will they go down by this much? Who knows? But I'm just telling you the concept is true. The higher the flow... The faster the gas, the higher the peak inspiratory pressure. The lower the flow, the slower the flow, the lower your peak inspiratory pressures will be. Okay? Now we're going to stick with the same example here. I'm going to put a flow here. Let's just go back. Let's just go with uh, 40 liters per minute. Okay? Flow, when you're in volume control, also affects your eye time because again the speed at which you give the gas is going to result in how fast the total amount of gas is delivered we're telling the vent to deliver 500 mls or 0.5 liters so if you're delivering 40 liters per minute that's how fast it's delivered the 500 tells it how long to deliver it at 40 liters per minute or how much to give. So the van says, okay, give, give 0.5 liters, but give it at this speed. The faster you give it, the shorter your eye time will be. The slower you give it, the longer your eye time will be. Okay, so let's work with this example right here. And let's just say we have a 68-year-old male and this 68-year-old male has uh, emphysema. Okay, so this would be almost like identical to a practice TMC exam. Okay, so you got a 68-year-old male with emphysema. He's on these settings right here. Tidal volume is appropriate for this patient. And your AVG is like this. 7.37. Your CO2 is 62. Your PO2 is 68 and your bicarb is 34. Now what do we want to do here? A, B, C, D. Do you want to increase the rate? Do you want to increase FiO2? Do you want to change to pressure control? Or do you want to increase your flow? Now, with what we have right now here, you don't really have a clear answer. But what if I told you also that on the patient's flow pattern, you observe this? And right here should jump out at you. Okay? Now, pause this video. Answer this question. Then unpause it and see if you correctly identify the correct answer, okay? So when we look at this question, we have lots of information here. 68-year-old male, emphysema, he's on a vent. We have vent settings, all the vent settings. Tidal volume is appropriate for this size patient. You're on a flow of 40, PIP of 5, 40%. This blood gas right here, okay? Now remember, emphysema, and from what we can tell, we may say, okay, well, we want to increase the rate. Well, why would we want to increase the rate? Well, because of this, CO2 is high. 
That's the wrong answer. It's not increase the respiratory rate. You don't want to blow this person's CO2 down to normal ranges. I told you he's an emphysematic. And based off of this blood gas, it looks like he lives in a state of chronic ventilatory failure. Some of you may know that as fully compensated respiratory acidosis. He lives at a state of hypercapnia, but his body, through his bicarb, is compensated for it. So a CO2 of 62 is only a problem when your pH is acidotic. That's when you would increase the rate to blow the CO2 down. Because you say, wait a second, CO2 is too high for this patient. But that's not the case here. This person lives at this level. Now you may say, well, let's increase the FIO2 because we're mildly hypoxemic. Okay, again, emphysematic, they live at a state of hypercapnia and also a state of chronic hypoxemia. So this person's saturation is probably somewhere around 95% here. And you're okay with that. If anything, we maybe would turn the FIO2 down and get him down to more like 90%, 91%. So this is where he lives. This blood gas is completely normal for this person. So there's nothing here. Next, do you want to change the pressure control? Well, you don't have any data up here that supports changing the pressure control. You don't have, you're not told anything about your peak inspiratory pressures. Your blood gas doesn't reveal anything that says that this mode of mechanical ventilation isn't working for the patient. So changing the pressure control would not be of a good answer here. That's almost the number one eliminated right off the bat. There's nothing saying go into pressure control. There's always going to be one answer that can be eliminated right off the bat. And this is the one in this scenario. And that leaves one answer. That's D, increase the flow. Now why would we increase the flow here? Well, this is where you have to understand your disease processes and you have to understand your airway graphics and you have to understand how flow affects eye time. And here's the breakdown of why we're going to increase the flow on this patient. This right here, because it did not return to baseline, this gap right here tells us that the patient is air trapping. If your expiratory flow does not return to baseline before going before the next breath starts, then your patient is air trapping. Why is the patient air trapping? Well, they have emphysema, which is a chronic obstructive lung disease, which means they're obstructed to flows, which means they can't get air out at a normal rate like healthy lungs can or even restrictive lungs. Their, their destruction of their AC membranes and their distal airways has created this obstructive process. So they need a longer E time to fully exhale. So what do we need to do? We need to make this inspiratory time shorter. How do we make eye time shorter in volume control? One of the ways we can do that is by increasing flow. We take this up to 70 liters per minute. This will get much shorter and will allow that to rise back to baseline prior to the next breath happening. Okay? That's how flow is applicable in respiratory therapy. There's more applications, but if you can grasp those, then you're in a good position understanding flow and how we can manipulate it through the therapies we give from the most basic nasal cannula up to the air entrainment devices, to the metanebs, to mechanical ventilation. Okay, guys. Hey, I hope this clarifies some of the misunderstanding about flow, understanding what it is. It's the speed of the gas. Your job is understanding how it affects what we're doing. Okay, and I hope this helped clarify that. Best wishes, guys.